many of the best spots along the ICW have already been taken up by almost or entirely derelict boats. And we're not the only ones who have gotten ourselves stuck on the mud looking for a spot to anchor on the shallow edges of the channel. Even gajillion dollar motorboats with three or four outboard engines ground themselves sometimes. You should put the boat on reverse, because then when you throttle the engines on reverse, it pushes water under the boat, causing it to actually lift up and causes like lubrication between the floor, and you got a better chance of going on whatever channel you. Should be a good time pushing my dinghy. It's got probably like 1,200 horsepower. I should go add two and a half more horsepower. <laughs> Maybe get it out. That's right. We finally found a 2.5 horsepower outboard from a neighbor that we traded up for our old broken outboard. What do I need to keep in mind now that I have? That a, always to make sure that the vent is open. You always have to make sure that the, the fuel is on, and that this is at the back neutral so minimum you can give one click and then start yeah pull start first time then clack put it in gear. Forward is in gear yeah it's only got in and out of gear it doesn't have a reverse so okay. was happy meanwhile mr endless horsepower was still stuck in the mud but well, the same way he's pushing forward more into the dry why, why does he he's not just you tried to tell him over the radio just I, now. I don't think he heard me. Now that we have a dinghy with an engine, Ravi can attempt to actually help people sometimes. He's gonna go see if they wanna go to land, if the guests wanna go to land. Well, it seems like what he's doing is actually suggesting to the guy <clears throat> to put an anchor out to try and catch the boat off. We'll see if that works. <laughs> we broke our windlass that way. Kedging the small anchor managed to budge the bow of the boat towards the direction of deeper water, but in the end, a towboat showed up and tugged the boat off the bank in about two minutes. Meanwhile, surrounding our boat were a fishing pod of dolphins, almost all of the group with noticeable propeller wounds. Everyone needs to slow down in the ICW too. Like I mentioned before, there are a lot of abandoned vessels along here, more than we imagined. Because it is impossible or illegal for people like us to just basically come along and try to refloat the vessel, raise it, salvage, or otherwise try to save the vessel, here in Florida, without lengthy paperwork and a sh ton of money, most vessels like this are doomed to just sit for months and or years. However, we learned that there are programs that exist to help boat owners dispose of their vessels that they cannot care for. If your vessel is at risk of becoming derelict, it still floats and it can be moved or towed, it will help you to surrender your vessel for very little cost. Once the vessel is in this kind of condition, for instance, then the cost for removal becomes much more. Poor Choco. He started with one eye weeping and now he's got yellow goo coming from both of his eyes. So it's definitely an eye infection, a bacterial infection. Show me your beautiful eyes. Hey, come here. How did that happen? Too much time spent at the dog park. For the first time here in Florida, we used a telehealth service for Choco. Although they were rather reluctant to give us a prescription, they did provide the medication in the end. The bill was a fraction of the cost of visiting a vet in person. Just kidding. It's just a normal blow. The usual 40 knots. It's just the usual 40 knots. You put out a little bit of extra anchor chain. We're on a mission this morning to get to somewhere where the water is slightly clear, where we'll feel comfortable jumping in the water and scraping the bottom. Because the bottom is absolutely filthy, full of shells. Not a good situation. After saying our goodbyes to our friendly neighbors and weighing anchor, we immediately got ourselves stuck in the mud on the very edge of the channel again.
But it was a quick fix, healing the boat over once the jib was raised. The boat was set free from the soft mud. We were back in a familiar place, doing circles in front of the raising bridge which would open for us to let us through on the hour. We met a fellow YouTuber filming us from above. Send us the footage! We'd love to see the footage! Ships International! We are Sailorama on YouTube! And then the channel began to look pretty shallow south of Fort Pierce here. We had read on Navionics that from here on, this portion of the ICW had some shallow spots. I think we got rain on our tail. Okay, you wanna look at the jackets, please? I think this brought the wind that we were hoping for today. Yeah, the front bus through. Joko, it's time for your eye drops. Yes. On the mud bank once a day before. <laughs> now you're staying nicely in the middle of the channel. Yeah, now I'm staying nicely in the middle of the channel. Once a day is enough. So you see at the lowest it's 80 meters? Yes. This is our only wind indicator at the moment. While sailing, we can make a quick estimation that because we're traveling at roughly 5 knots, the true wind speed is closer to 34 knots, seeing as we're feeling, or rather, the apparent wind speed is 29 knots while we're moving forward. That's why it can feel so much calmer when running downwind in flat seas such as these. Steering the boat and looking at things on Amazon. Yeah. What are you looking to buy? AIS. AIS, potentially maybe radar. Extra GPS antenna so it stops losing signal. Like, me and my and Chuck was like one little joy. Interesting beside it. They can see really well from this angle now. It's even better from this angle. And then began a portion of the ICW with many wind surfers. Maybe it was just the perfect wind that day. One last bridge before the sun was going to set that day, and we turned the corner to anchor right at that causeway. We knew that it would be shallow coming into the spot, and we tried to slow down. Come back down to 1.9. Easy sailing day, except for 
That one moment with the power lines. Damn it. It's like everything was going so literally smoothly. For navigation, of course, we check our route before we get there. We look on the charts and information from other boaters. The height of the power line sh at the highest, it says in the middle of the channel, should be 90 feet for our 55 foot I mast. Can't move. And it says at the lowest point elsewhere, outside of the channel, the clearance is 60 feet, so that's a lot less clearance. We get there and there's basically a drooping of the power lines. The channel seems to go right under the lowest part of the drooping. It does not look like 90 feet. So we're, we're just there having a heart attack thinking we're definitely gonna touch. <laughs> when you're going under a bridge, you can really harm your mast and maybe take down your mast. But when you're going under power lines, what happens if, if we touch them? We get electrocuted, right? No, the short circuit. We, we don't get electrocuted. Our boat's fiberglass. The mast will start heating up. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of like, we don't know. <laughs> we don't want to find out. If anybody knows what can happen if your mast touches a power line. High tension power lines. High tension power lines. We would love to know because we, we don't want to know, but we have to know. Otherwise, very smooth sailing. We have a serious case of barnacle butt, and we've got about six bridges, uh, six lifting bridges to go under today, and we're moving very slowly. We're gonna see how many we can do in one day. Yeah, it's what we call the saw blade bottom. Uh, it's probably mud with sand just it's being... Like it's probably like uh, waves uh, caused by current pushing the sand into wave patterns, but man, it looks nasty. Since time we filmed the island full of birds. This would not be our only jibe of the day, unfortunately. The shoaling at St. Lucie Inlet was visible and made it pretty daunting to imagine exiting to the open ocean here. They must have come through here and dredged. I spoke too early. We were passed by a smaller sailboat that recognized our YouTube channel and reminded us of how utterly sluggish our vessel is with her barnacle butt. Without sails up, we could barely keep up three knots, but the wind was an almost too perfect northerly pushing us along downwind. We prepared for our first opening bridge of the day and discussed what relevant info for the radio communication would be. Hobie Sound Bridge, Hobie Sound Bridge. This is sailing vessel in Esperada, southbound, requesting an opening. This is Hobie Sound Bridge. What is your height and your length here? 55 feet high, we are 12 feet wide, and we are 40 feet long. ET in five minutes. Roger, Captain, go copy. Thank you very much. Standing by channel nine. Right after filming our downwind configuration of the mainsail, we had another only semi-controlled jibe, and the sail burst open right at the belly. Great timing, of course, just as the bridge was lifting, and we were moments away from passing through. Right along the stitching, huh? Yeah. We passed by very slowly, chugging along below three knots, probably holding up some early morning traffic on the roadway. As Robbie frantically coaxed the poor old mainsail down, Our main is 
is no more. Well, that was fun. Going through the bridge with a main ripping moments before. A jibe happens when sailing downwind. The wind may shift or the direction of the vessel might change. In either case, the sail can come around forcefully. In our case, the movement finished our mainsail. Now we only had the jib to help our engine along. The houses and visible wealth grew along the banks of the waterway, and so did the traffic on the waterway. There's gonna be some jet skis. You're gonna have to, like, deal with it. And the traffic did not let up nearing the bridges. Let me know if you want me to... No, no. Well, we're going the speed that we're supposed to be going. We desperately tried to use the jib to help us pass through this bridge opening at a more reasonable speed, but the jib just jibed around as well. I imagined all the pissed off motorists shaking fists at us for moving so slow. There's lots of people swimming here. Yeah. And there's nothing. There's nothing? There's no bridge? If this was the Jupiter Federal Bridge. This is crazy. And it's under construction. So we just have to follow markers to stay in the channel. There's nothing to follow. Yeah, the Town Bridge Main opens on the hour and a half hour. Indian Town Street Bridge. This is sailing vessel and Esperada southbound. I'm just wondering if us southbound goes first or the northbound catamaran. I'm not going to make the call, but from what I hear the nautical folks say, it's the person that has the uh, uh, tide with them. Okay, All we right, we will proceed. That's the catamaran back there. Double happy. They're quite a bit of ways away, so I think he probably beat him through there. Blender. I just called the Don Ross Bridge, letting them know we're going to be estimated to arrive right on the opening time. Just crazy with the amount of traffic. And they're giant outriggers, they're almost as tall as masts, and they're trying to decide whether they can go through or not. We're gonna make a tiny little spin, a little pirouette, but we gotta be careful because we're not so good at maneuvering, spinning backwards. Sometimes we had to circle back before the bridge would open, which was unnerving because with the tide pushing us southward, it was difficult to turn quickly among the relentless high-speed power boats, who were zooming around way above the posted speed limits. for other boats. I mean, a very high speed boat, boats coming through a very sh 
shallow and narrow and full of bridge area. The, bri the bridges like are fine. Trailing. Oh, there's a big boat coming. He's he's gonna be clear. We didn't think we were gonna make the Parker Bridge, but he's right here, right around the corner, faster than we thought. So, shit, we're, we need to speed up too. We'd made it through all our lifting bridges for the day. The last, the last, the last ones. Had to wait for that. We're like, oh, we're gonna slow down. And we turned the corner, right? They're like, no. Nope. Next stop, West Palm Beach. Yeah. We made our way down south of that gigantic anchorage looking for the so-called public dock, the only way to shore within five or so miles of any place. But apparently, f everybody who's trying to get to shore for necessities of life, am I right? So apparently we can't get to shore here. These public docks are actually not open. So there's just no access to land and they don't want us to access land. So we had to find our own path to shore to walk the dog. Going to the Publix and the beauty and the wonder and the fountains, the celebration of groceries. The large motor yacht's got the right of way. Let them come through first and you can pass through once they are clear. He's not making it easy for top five, hey? So even with all that, even with Towboat USA standing by and acting as a pilot, there was a misunderstanding that top five wanted to go through first. Somebody, I think it was Towboat USA, said, no, you don't go first because there's boats in the, you know, inside the two bridges. Yes. And then the Flagler Bridge, which is this one, said, uh, uh, top five, we are waiting for you to go. And then top five went. Navigating these channels and opening bridges is definitely a challenge for boats. And I imagine it's pretty dang stressful for the bridge operators as well. There are many moorings around Peanut Island. Like this one here, who we discovered from the boat neighbor, belongs to Zach. We just grabbed one random mooring. We thought maybe that it belonged to the city, just like the public dock on the island, which can be used during the daylight hours, first come, first serve. First, you're gonna try the, for just the prop, help us move along a little better. But look at that, I can see your fin in the water, like, that's ten times more visibility than what we've been having. What's the... We thought the prop was going to be really dirty, but in fact, there's nothing on the prop, and it's just the rest of the, the vessel that's kind of dirty. The copper on the prop has kept all the barnacles from growing. 
we don't have any anti-fouling or chemicals on, on the prop at all. What's your prognosis? I'm definitely gonna dive with the scraper and the, and the thing to give him a good thing and then we should have at least two more knots. And then they have this like really long thing they catch here and they inch like an, a worm. Like inchworms. It's like a mix between a worm and a praying mantis. Ugh. I'm covered. Oh my god. We keep going, gotta go. Patriot, stand up. Patriot, stand up. We ended up dropping the mooring before sunset and anchoring with our own trusted anchor and chain that evening. So here's the barbecue results from another day. The next morning was all about keeping our vessel operational, measuring for sails, and taking the plunge to finish cleaning the bottom. 25 and below would be a storm sail. Here he's measuring the foot of the possible secondhand sails that we're looking to get. Basically 17 feet is 100%, 20 feet is about 110, 28 feet is a big sail. It's like, like 180, I would say. That would, be, that would be monstrous. Very, very light wind sail. We traveled back up towards one of the friendly opening bridges that we'd passed under before. To take time to smell the absolutely fragrant jasmine along the side of the strode while Robbie took a ride out to the sail depot. He managed to grab the last and only well-fitting furling mainsail available. And now was the moment of truth. 